And when Becky was talking about her parents not believing in eternal security, anybody who does not believe in eternal security eventually starts looking at their self in the flesh, what they do, rather than looking at us the way God sees us. He doesn't see the things we do, good or bad. He's, if, if Christ is living in you, he sees that. It, it, and then when Christ is not living in you, he doesn't see anything but the righteousness of Christ in you. And, uh, but, but the point is, is, is to, the, that, that's an important doctrine that people seem to get at one point and don't keep it, don't, don't uh, always keep it in their mind. And uh, I appreciate Gary's songs that express that. Uh, years ago when uh, we used to have some Bible studies down in the basement of the church with Mr. Marshall, my dad's, uh, one of his older cousins, Lee Pike, would be called on to pray. And uh, boy, when that man would pray, everything that came out of his mouth was an appreciation of what God has made us in Christ. And, and you could immediately catch on to the de depth of his spirituality just by listening to him pray. Because uh, he was practicing just what that song was all about. So I, I really appreciate that, that doctrine and those who express it because it shows spiritual maturity. Now, Romans chapter 12 is where we've been studying. We studied there last week. Uh, we're going to look again at these, the very first verse, not even verse 2 yet. Verse 1 this week, and we'll do it again next week, because I want to come at this from several different ways, and I just don't know how to express it all except just to uh, back up and hit it again, uh, because they're actually, uh, I'll read the verse in a second, we'll have a word of prayer, but we've been working our way to this verse for a year now. We've been studying all about the Christian life, how God works in the Christian life, how the Christian life operates, the different, we started out the difference between spirit, soul, and body. You'll see it all emerge back again as we uh, study this, this section, both verses 1 and 2. But uh, all the things that we study came to a point that the Christian life is going to all be lived out of an understanding and a presentation that you're being called on to present yourself before God in the fashion of Romans chapter 12 verse 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do ask again as we look again at this passage of Scripture that you speak to our hearts. Allow your word to find its way past all the things that block it from ever penetrating our heart. And Father, I pray that we'll be receptive to the things that you have to say and then realize that it's calling on us to do something here. And I pray decisions will be made concerning what their life is going to be about and, uh, and, and decisions that will honor you with the lifelong service that you're worthy of. And so I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Last week as we introduced this verse, uh, let me just say that some of the emotion expressed in the verse is a, a very personal thing because as I was sharing my own encounters of coming to grips with, the, with what Romans 12 is, verse 1 is asking us to do, it was life changing for me. So naturally there was, um, there's emotion involved and, and I was expressing that and couldn't even hold back some of the emotion last week. But you need to, the emotion, that was just for me. I mean that just mine. You're not to be motivated out of the emotion. You're to be motivated out of God tugging on your heart. And I, I would hope that in the years to come that there be a testimony of some who have been with us as we studied about the Christian life and came to this point and realized there's a decision time to be made in their life that there'd be a decision that will be made that when they express it years from now the emotion won't be Pastor Boucher's emotion it'll be their own personal emotion as they understood that there was a calling that they have of God but one that God is only going to use them if they present themselves to him and that's what this passage is about. We're, we realized, and we said last week, and, and I kept trying to illustrate it with Abraham's life and all, that there is two great decisions that a person needs to make in life, upon which all other decisions in life will be based. So there's a lot of decisions you make, but there's two great ones. The first is salvation, to be saved, to realize that you're a sinner on your way to hell, and all your religious experience, all your religious efforts, or your non-religious experience and non-religious efforts doesn't gonna, isn't going to save you. That you're a sinner, and naturally we're born in sin, and we're all heading to hell. But God, who hates sin, loves the sinner, and provided for us a salvation that can only be provided for through Jesus Christ. 
that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. There's no other work of redemption that can cleanse you from your sins except for the blood of Jesus Christ shed at Calvary's cross. There's no other propitiation that God would accept. There's no other work that God will accept other than the fact that Jesus Christ went to the cross and died and paid for every one of your sins, trespasses, iniquities, offenses, everything that you've ever done wrong. Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for them. And God will freely give you eternal life as a free gift from Him, no matter what you've done, no matter what you will do, if you'll believe that Jesus Christ took your place and died on the cross for your sins. You come to God through Christ, and He'll freely give you everlasting life. The first decision you need to make in life is to be saved. Because this other decision, if you're not saved, God doesn't care about who you serve because you're only serving the devil. You're only going to end up in hell. But, so you first need to get saved. But after you get saved, there's another real important decision in life. And that is, what are you going to live for? What, who are you going to live for? Uh, there's, a, there's a poem, I used to read it at different times, it's called The Clock of Life. And it starts out, the clock of life is wound but once. And so then it goes on to express what are you going to do with the time that you have, that time is a precious gift. But see, we've been talking about the Christian life. And I'm not asking you to think about that you've given one life and what are you, how you're going to live your life. If you're a believer, you've been given two lives. You've been given life just to breathe air. But when you trust that Jesus Christ is your Savior, you've been given eternal life. And you've been given the life of God's Son. Now what are you going to do with that life? That if you're a believer, the, life, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Christ, lives in you. And when it says to be a living sacrifice, it's real clear to me that you need to be the sacrifice and Jesus Christ needs to be the living part of that verse. You die to yourself, your will, your desires, your wants, and you allow Christ to live in you. That's what the Christian life is all about. And, and now that you've been given this precious life of eternal life that's never going to end, what are you going to do with it? You have this time on earth to live for the Lord, and you have eternity, eternity future to live for the Lord. But right now, in this time, when you've gotten saved, what are you going to do with the life that God has given you? Are you going to squander it? Are you going to shelter it? Are you going to bury it? Are you going to receive eternal life and just wait to serve Him in glory? Or are you going to take this opportunity to realize that the most important decision you can make about this life is to give it back to Him? To present yourself, what this says, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And when we get to verse 2, you understand how it is that you do the sacrificing and the life that's, that's going to be transformed within you is going to be the life of Christ. And that this life, that this body that you walk around in can actually be Jesus Christ producing his life, reliving his life on earth through you during this present time. But that says present. And when Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, we're not under the law. God's not going to say, he's not, he's not saying, I've saved you and now by law you have to serve me and if you don't, I'm going to whack you and destroy you and ruin your life and make you miserable until you serve me. God is actually looking for you to learn some things about his love and grace and to be motivated out of love and grace to present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. To actually, just like when you, got, when you got saved, hopefully there was a time you just prayed and said, Thank you, Lord, that you saved me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for your salvation. The only response that you could ever give to grace is, a, a, is to receive the gift by faith and say thank you. That's the only, that's the only response that, that you can give because grace is, not, uh, grace is unmerited, undeserved. It's a gift from God. And what do you do when you receive a gift? Except say thank you. So the life that we've been given as well is, an, is an, there's a time in which you realize based on the mercies of God, the gift that he has given you, that you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. That you thank him for the gift of life and, and, uh, and, and make some decisions about how that life is going to be spent. But our point is, is it, it starts out, I beseech you. And I said last time that beseech is not uh, like beg. A lot of times it's, people say it means to beg. Uh, other places say it, it's to urge, but certainly it's to, it's to request or make an appeal based on reason. That's why it ends by saying, which is your reasonable service. That's why it says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God. There, he's expecting you to have understood some things about mercy, 
and why it's reasonable that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. It, that's why we spent a year before we got to this point to teach some of those things about God's mercy so that based on that understanding, then you could be you can have an appeal for you to present yourself this way to God. And so he says, I beseech you. In fact, I was surprised. I told you some, uh, was it 21 times that the Apostle Paul uses this word? There's actually 20 verses, 21 times he uses it. And, uh, and it's really something you, not unique to Paul because it's about 30 times in the New Testament. But, but it's unique in the sense that that is the only way that grace can appeal. Grace, if it's not, if it's not law, it's not I command you, it's I beseech you. And so it's a, a based on the grace of God toward us that this appeal is made. And I, I didn't realize it at the time, but Romans chapter 12, verse 1 is the first time that's found in your Bible, where Paul uses it in the Bible concerning you. And he, and he appeals to you based on the mercies of God. And as we said, Romans 9, 10, 11 is all about the... Dis, not, Romans 1 through 5 is your salvation, the grace and mercy of God for your salvation. 6, 7, and 8 is your new identification that God has given you in His Son that we just talked about a moment ago. Romans 9, 10, 11 is the dispensational change that God, rather than judging the world and damning the world, in His mercy offered salvation to everyone, and we who receive the salvation message, we are recipients of that grace and His mercy and His love and life. And, and so based on that, he says, I, I beseech you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Come with me to Galatians chapter 4. The reason we turn here is when it comes to the age of grace, God's dealing with us different in grace than he is under the law. And, and you learn the difference in, in an illustration right here in Galatians chapter 4 where you understand that your position in Christ, the fact that God today when He saves us, not only are we not under the law, but the reason we don't have to be under the law, He's given us His Holy Spirit. We got God's Word, His complete Word of God that's able to make you not only wise, but also is able to work throughly in you to make you perfect unto every good work. So you got God's Word, but you also have God's Spirit in you. And uh, through the Word and the Spirit, you, God can now treat you as a mature um, man or woman of God. I, I say it that way because a child is immature, and God's not dealing with us in immaturity. In the age of grace, there's a maturity about this age. Now, we talk about young believers, and certainly a young believer needs to mature. But he has the tools to mature. He's got a complete Bible. And the moment you got saved, you received the Holy Spirit. And because of the message of grace, you're able to be a mature believer, even, even at a young age, spiritually. Romans chapter, uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Now I say that an heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Now we've been talking about Don and, and Becky going to the mission field there. One of the ways that Don helps to hopes to support herself permanently on the mission field, is she's a nanny. And, uh, and, and so, you, you know, people, you can get into other countries and, and serve as a nanny. But I, when I read that verse, I thought of her. Because as a nanny, she, she could be in a rich person's house, and she's responsible for those kids, and she'll tutor them and govern them and tell them what to do and when to do it because she was hired to be that with her child. So a child could be an heir of some vast fortune. And, 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 but because it's a child, it, it's under tutors and governors. The parents make sure of that. It says, even so, uh, uh, actually the end of verse 2 says, but are under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. There would come a time in such a situation that a child who is under tutors and governor, uh, governors, but as a child who is an heir of some fortune and some maybe a business that the father is running, there comes a time where a father would say to the nanny, to the governor, to the tutors, uh, okay, you no longer have authority over my child. My child now is a full-grown, mature, responsible person. They're, bringing, they're going to be brought into a place of maturity and into their inheritance. It says in verse 3, Even so, we also, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the, uh, of the world. But when the fullness of time came, was come, 
God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. So there came a time in which God's dealings with mankind changed from dealing with them with tutors and governors under the law to dealing with man differently, and it took Jesus Christ to come in and to die on the cross and to rise from the dead before God would change the way He would deal. But when, we, when the fullness of time came, uh, was come, God sent forth a son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we should receive the adoption of sons. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of adoption. Where now God is going to, because he's put his spirit within the people, now he's going to work with them, work with them not through the external law, but by means of his spirit, and of course always his word. And so it says in verse 6, and, and because ye are sons, God hath set forth his spirit, the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through, through Christ. Howbeit then, when you knew not God, ye did service unto them which are by nature no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? Now Paul is scolding the Galatians here because they didn't realize where they are in God's dealings with mankind. They were trying to act like the nation of Israel. When God was dealing with Israel, they were under the law, and then God's going to put His Spirit within them, and then work within them to cause them to keep His laws and commandments. There's a new covenant for the nation of Israel. But before God continued dealing with His nation of Israel, He stopped dealing with them. Here He's saving Gentiles, the Galatians. And the Galatians got saved, received the spirit of adoption, and you know what they want to do? They want to go study Israel's law to find out how to be servants and obedient unto the law. And God's got a whole new way that he's dealing with mankind on a more mature level as an adult. You know what an adult is? Someone who knows better and is responsible to make right decisions. Now, a child doesn't know better. They don't know. They, can, they, they, run out, they see the ball go in the street. They just run out in the street. But there comes a time where you become an adult and you realize, man, there's cars zipping up and down that street all the time. I better stop and look first. And so they, they have the freedom and, and the wisdom to make choices, responsible choices. Sometimes you make dumb choices, but that's what an adult's allowed to do, isn't it? And, and you learn from your dumb mistakes because as an adult you pay the penalty. You don't just get scolded or go to juvenile court and, and get some minor fine. You get some big penalties against you. You can't break some laws. There's some things you cannot do. So you learn the hard way, but you're still an adult who's responsible for the decisions you make. That's how God's dealing with us today. By His Word and by His Spirit. The Galatians wanted to go back under the law. Keep Sabbath days, holy days, make God happy by doing all those things. And those aren't the things that God's requiring today. And, and so the Apostle Paul is scolding them for wanting to go backwards. And, and, and that's, that's the point. That's when Romans chapter 12, when he says, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present yourselves a living sacrifice. Paul's done everything to bring you to a place of maturity in the Christian life. He's given you God's word, the, the message of salvation, your identification with Christ, the dispensational change, so you know where to find in the Bible God's word to you. Now he says, present yourself. Now it's decision time. Now that you're an adult, and you understand you're an adult, now make the right decision. Now, it's amazing to me, the book of Galatians and the book of Corinthians. The book of Galatians, Paul is rebuking these people because when they, got, when they would understand where they are in the program of God, they wanted to revert back to law and religion. And you know, that, that, that's where people want to go a lot of times. There's a lot of times that people, rather than being responsible to study God's Word and realize what God is doing today and how God is working in them and how God wants to mature them and renew their mind to make the decisions that honor Him in life, they'd rather just go back to religion, tell me what to do, what day to show up, how to go through the ceremony, how to, how to look real nice, and then how to go home and make sure that I please God and now I'll just live any way I want. A lot of people look, turn back to religion. And that's immaturity. Paul, when you read this passage, he says, I'm in doubt of you. How, how could someone go back to the religious system that couldn't save in the first place and now want to please God that way? That's immaturity. Grace put, brings you place, to a place of maturity and lets you operate according to the, the, what God's Word said. Now, there's more to learn. We'll learn what God's Word said, but it's the time to grow up and make some choices. The Galatians didn't want to do that. 
The other people are the Corinthians, where their problem wasn't the doctrine and wanted to go back to religion. What they wanted to do is still live the way they lived before. In all the sin and all the irresponsible, irrational, sinful, fleshly living lifestyle. They didn't realize that they have been saved from sin, identified with Christ, given the life of Christ, and now are responsible to glorify God with that life. They wanted to be chi children and, not, and act like there's no decision to make not, and, 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 li and let their fleshly desires be the impulse living of their life. Now that, that's, th that's living without thinking. That's living without realizing who you are and what you're responsible for. So Paul has to deal with both those two people and both those two bents go in the world. Look, at, look again at verse 4, uh, chapter 4, and look at verse 9, no, verse 8. It says, How be it then, when you knew God, ye did service unto them which are by nature no gods. Now that is when you knew not God. <laughs> How be it when you knew not God. Now he's reminding them, before you got saved, you actually did service to those who were not even gods. Who aren't true God. Now I throw that out to you so that you realize that you know what they didn't do before they got saved? They didn't serve themselves. Now keep that in mind, and come with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Now this, is, this chapter does, in one chapter, what Paul does in about uh, six chapters in the book of Romans. In fact, he does it in the first 13 verses, what uh, Romans did in chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. And that is, uh, actually 1 through 5, 1 through 12 uh, in, in this. He first points out how you're dead in sins and then God saved you by his grace. Now, the reason we're reading this, remember the appeal. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice. You have to know something about the mercies of God that's going to change the way you think and realize it's only reasonable that I serve God. So, and, and the thing that's going to cause you to reason that out is if you think about the mercies of God. So we're going to look at this chapter and realize the mercies of God in saving us and dispensationally changing His program with mankind so that we now, as members of the body of Christ, become His servants here on earth. We're saved and called for his service. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now quicken means made alive. The you in that verse, if you just back up through the, into chapter 1, it'll, it's identified the people that he's writing to is in verse 19 of chapter 1 when it says, he's praying that you might know the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who what? Who believe. Chapter 2, verse 1, and you, who's the you? You who believe, hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's who God has quickened. He doesn't quicken you so that you can believe. He takes the believer and he makes you alive. He's given you life. He's imparted the Holy Spirit in you. He's actually given you as a possession right now. The moment you believe, Ephesians 1.13 over there, he seals you with his Holy Spirit. It's the down payment of your inheritance. You're an heir. And, and as an heir of God, you're not a child anymore. You're a, a full-grown adult son by the Spirit given to you. So you hath he quickened, but he reminds you that you were dead in trespasses and sins. Now when he reminds you that, he says in verse 2, wherein time past, now we study our Bible, time past, but now, ages to come, but now we're studying your life. That time past is the time before you got quickened. Before you were saved. Before you believed the gospel and got saved, verse 2 is talking about your time past, your previous time before salvation. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now remember, ultimately we want God's spirit to work in you. Before you were saved, there was a spirit working in you. It's the spirit, it's the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. It's a satanic spirit. It's a fallen spirit. 
And, and in that verse 2, it reminds you that before you got saved, you walked according to the course of this world. Now, you know, there's all kinds. You can turn on your TV and you can watch NASCAR now. They got it on TV more than they've ever had. But, you know, they move from one place to another, and every time they do, the course is different. But you know what never changes? Every car goes the same direction on that course. Someone had laid out a course, no matter what shape that course might be, it's been laid out, and those people who race that car, now they try to do it at different speeds, but they're all going the same direction. They're going the course that's been laid out for them to go, because someone laid out that course. This is golf season. Got my golf jacket on. Larry said, where'd you get that? I said, I won it golfing. <laughs> But anyhow, <laughs> lies set aside. <laughs> this is golf season. You know what they play golf on? Courses. And you know what? Every one of those guys, they'll either start on the, on the what the 10th hole and work their way to the 18th, or they'll start on the first hole, work their way to the 9th. But you know what? Everybody is doing it in the same order. They go to the same tee off place, they hit it to the same direction. When they finish there, they give you the scorecard, because sometimes, and I've done this, where I think, oh, the next hole's over here, and I tee off, and I'm, in the, I'm, I'm out of order. I, I went to the wrong hole. You've got to actually look at the map, because it, all those, that golf course is all laid out by a guy who designed it, and every one of those golfers just go that course. They just constantly do the same thing. Why do they do that? Someone else laid it out for them, and they're all doing it. Ephesians 2, verse 2, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Later on in this book, Paul talks about how we wrestle against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness, and high places. That prince that laid out the course, that before you were saved you walked in, was the devil. He has laid out the course that all the lost people of this world are walking. It goes on even in the same expression. The, power, the, the, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. You realize that's evil, satanic spirit that we're talking about here. The reason I'm expressing that to you, Paul says, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I would dare think that there's people live, sitting here that says, I don't want to live for the devil, but I'm not sure I want to live for God. I want to, do, I want to live for myself. I want to do what I want to do, and I want to do it my way. I I'm a self-independent, self-worshipping man. <laughs> uh, I I'm going to live life my way. You fool. You're a fool, you think that. All kinds of people thinking, I'm, I'm living life my way, and all they're doing is walking the course that Satan had laid out for this world to be guided by. Whether it be the finances, whether it be lust of the flesh, uh, all that's in the world. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. People just power and authority. One of those three things, that every person in this world is following that if they're not living for the Lord. They're thinking, I'm doing my thing. I'm going to get rich my way. I'm going to get popular my way. I, I, I'm going to just enjoy life my way. And none of them are doing it their way. They're doing it the way Satan laid out for them to do. He's guiding their flesh right through the course of life straight to hell. Amen. Now, you can get saved from hell, but how are you going to live your life? Walking the same old course you've been walking? My point to you is that when you're living your life your way, you're full of it. You're not living your life your way. You're living for the devil. Yes. The one who's designed life to be lived the way that everyone else in this world is living it. And unless you present your bodies unto God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him which is your reasonable service, you're still fooled by the devil. And you might be walking around thinking, I'm living my way. I'm going to do what I want. No, you're not. You're doing what he wants. You've got to read the scriptures and believe it to understand that, but that's what you're living life based on. Verse 3, among whom we all, and Paul says, I'm, I'm one with you. Tell mom we said hello, dad. <laughs> uh, it's a good call because she's in the hospital, and I'm sure this is come pick me up call. Hopefully it's that. <laughs> Verse 3, <laughs> among whom also we all had our conversation. You know, conversation is your, your lifestyle, your manner of life. And Paul's saying, you know, that's, I used to live that way too. You know how Paul did it? He was doing it the religious way, like the Galatians. 
Some people do it the sinful way, but either way, it's the course of Satan, among whom we all had our conversation. Conversation, uh, someone said it this way, uh, conversation is, is your manner of life, your walk of life. But someone has said, what you do, speak so loud, I can't hear what you say. And when you think of that, think of that word conversation, because conversation is not just expressed on what you say about yourself. Your lifestyle, all, all anybody, especially the devil, but all any of us have to do is just watch you. And we'll know what your life is all about. We'll watch how many times you show up on Sunday and how many times you don't. We know what's important to you. Now that's, you know, not, we're not to judge, we're not going to condemn you and all the rest, but you know what people live their life based on. All you got to do is watch them. That, that, that's your conversation. Before a person was saved, among whom we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. See that, that, those expressions there? When they walked according to the course of the world, it's laid out right there. In time past, you walked according to the lust of your flesh. The flesh dictated what kind of life you were going to live. Some people live just to satisfy the lusts of their flesh. That's where it leads to so much immorality. Because later on in Ephesians, it'll talk about your flesh being greedy. It's never satisfied, never has enough. That's why you go from the 60s to free love, to all of a sudden everybody comes out of the closet, they're homosexuals. Why? Well, they got tired of this kind of love, let's try this kind of love. Now everyone's got perverted, worse, I mean, it was sinful here, now it's perverted. But that's because... They're going to go worse. I won't even tell you where they're going to go. It's already happening, but it's going to be worse. That's why pedophilia is, is growing problem. That's why all that... It, because you can't satisfy the flesh. But some people who are before they're saved, they live just by based on their flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh. Desire is the seat of your emotion. That's, you, down in this next verse, we're going to talk about your heart. Desires coming out of your heart. Now it's not just your flesh dictating, but the flesh dictates, and then your heart only wants what the flesh wants. That's your soul making a decision to live for the flesh. And then it says, and of the mind. Now the spiritual man, all he thinks about is the flesh is dictating his desire and what he thinks about and what he's going to study and what he's going to do. It's all, that is, body, soul, spirit. The believer is to live his life the exact opposite of that. Paul prays that God would sanctify you wholly, your whole spirit, soul, and body, preserved blameless. That you're to be controlled by God's Holy Spirit. That, that is the, from the inside, the spirit, God's spirit, not your spirit, God's spirit working in you. To will, there's your desire, and to do, there's your flesh of God's good pleasure. Now God has a different course. Apparently it's the opposite of the devil's course. But before you were saved, you walked this way. It says, but, but verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, where he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places, that in the ages to come, now here we are in heaven, sitting in, well, in, in heavenly places with Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. That's why it says we're saved by grace. Verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now notice that's salvation. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship. God's working in us. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Given that new identity. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now God living out through us. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now notice how all that came out of that phrase in verse 4. Here's we were dead in our sins, but verse 4 says, But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherein he loved us, why we're dead, he saved us. Not only did he save us, he sit, he's got a place for us in heavenly places in Christ. There, our position is there, our hope is there, ages to come we're going to be examples of his grace, and God's going to work in us now and in eternity future for his glory. So, those of us who are walking the course of Satan, God used this way. Now, how does grace respond to that? Based on the mercies of God, what do you do? Well, grace should have a response of, Lord, if that's what you saved me for, use me now. Yes. 
I don't want to just wait to heavenly places to be an example of your grace and kindness. I want to, be, I want to show forth your grace and kindness now. And God who loved you that much wants to use you, but you need to present yourself. You have to make this decision. I can't make it for you just like I couldn't make a decision of salvation. Based on that mercy, there's two things I need to show you yet. Come back with me, these Old Testament examples. First to Ezra, chapter 9. Now this is an appeal based on the mercies of God. I beseech you by the mercies of God. And if we... Uh, I can't dwell any more on the mercy part. It's now time for you to think about your decision. But I want to show you an example of some people that God showed some mercy to and then turn around and walk the course of Satan with that mercy that was given to them and how Ezra described this in a prayer to God that realizing that these people, rather than the mercies of God, them making in, uh, informed, intelligent mature, responsible decision about their life, they reacted as immature, irresponsible, ungrateful children. Now, Ezra is right after 2 Chronicles, and it's interesting in your Bible that you, you have prophets that spoke after this, but 2 Chronicles ends where Israel, is because of their sinfulness and turning away from God, worshiping idols, God put them into the hands of the Gentiles. The Gentiles took them off of their land, into Gentile lands, replaced them in their land for 70 years. And after 70 years, a small remnant of Jews were allowed to come back under Zerubbabel and start rebuilding their temple and start establishing themselves back in the land. Ezra followed Zerubbabel, and actually where they came back and rebuilt the temple, Ezra came back to build the people up spiritually as a scribe. When he did that, look at Ezra 9. He had to go away on political business. And when he got back, here's what confronted him. It says in verse nine, chapter 9, verse 1, now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, now he just got back home to the land, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have, have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations. Well, you read down, you know what Ezra does? He starts pulling his beard out. He starts throwing dust in the air. He sits in, in sackcloth and ashes. Because after all that Israel, in all their rebellion, God teaches them a lesson, takes them into captivity, then shows mercy on them and brings them back and starts building them up spiritually. Their teacher walks away for a month, six months, wherever he's gone. He comes back and the people went right back into sin. Is that what God saved them for? Is that why God brought them back from, so they could just go back into sin again? Did God save you so you could continue to live in sin? Romans 6 says, God forbid. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them, but you have to make the decision. These people made some bad decisions. Ezra chapter 9 verse 5, it says, now here's Ezra's prayer. Listen to this thing. At the evening sacrifice I arose from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell on my knees and spread my hands unto the Lord my God. And I said, O Lord my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities have, are increased over our heads and our trespasses have grown up unto the heavens. Since the day our fathers have, uh, since the days of our fathers have been, have we been in great trespass unto this day. For our iniquities we have we, our kings, our priests, uh, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, and to captivity, to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. And now for a little space grace hath been shown from the Lord our God, to leave us a remnant to escape, and to give us a nail in this holy place. That, my, that our God may lighten our eyes and, and give us a little reviving in our bondage. Oh Lord, you, you just started to bless. You just started blessing us just a little bit. We, are, we were your bondmen, yet our, our God, we were bondsmen, but yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia, to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judea and in Jerusalem. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? 
for we have forsaken thy commandments, we have, uh, which, which thou hast commanded thy servants, the prophets, saying, This land whereunto ye go to possess it is an unclean land, with filthiness of the people of the lands, and their, with, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end even unto the other with their uncleanness. Now therefore give not our daughters unto your, their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever, for that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land, to leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our, for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that our God hath punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and has given us such deliverance from this. Now do you realize what he's praying there? Oh, he's given us mercy, he's given us grace, he's punished us less than we deserve. After God's been so good to us when we don't deserve it. Verse 14 says, should we again break thy commandments and join affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldest thou not ang be angry with us till thou hast consumed us so that, there will, so that there should be no remnant or escaping? You see what he's saying, don't you? After God's been so gracious, should we join ourselves affinity? Just join us one. We're one with the world. Going to live and do like they do. How, you know what he's saying? How could you do that? He's blushing before God. He can't even lift his hand, eyes to pray. How could someone saved by God's grace turn around and go back and do those things? Do you think that way about sin in your life? See, the reason I'm reading that, where do we start out? You're no longer a child. You're a son. You're a mature son of God. This is immature living. This is ungrateful living. And if you haven't presented yourselves unto God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. You are, even though God has given you the position of a full mature son, you are living as immature, irresponsible, ungrateful children of God. And you need to wake up and realize that. That God didn't save you so you could join affinity with the world and live like them. God saved you for his glory. And you have the capacity and the ability to live for God's glory. I'd like to show you just one in closing yet. Luke chapter, I think it's 7. It's 17. Luke chapter 17. This is not a hard illustration. What's the one thing that grace can do? How, how, what's the one response that grace accepts? Well, faith you could say, but the other is just thank you. Being thankful. Think about this. Luke chapter 17. And I'm going to start in verse 11. It says, It came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that they passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as they entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were, that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have what? Have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourself unto the priest. And it came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. See, when he said, Go, show yourself the priest, the, it's the priest who is going to declare that they are indeed cleansed of leprosy. He tells them to go. They turn to go and boom, they're cleansed before they even got to the priest. They see it themselves. They're calling from a far way because with a the leprosy, they can't come close to him. That's like you being dead in your trespasses and sins. You have no contact with God, no reproach. You cannot approach unto God in your uncleanness. But Jesus Christ cleansed these. Now verse 9, 15 it says, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, and with a small quiet voice glorified God. Oh man, this guy looked, saw that leprosy, deterioration of his flesh, gone. He's not going to die in the, in the misery of that sin or in that, in that uh, disease. And he turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. What a slap in the face to Israel, huh? And Je that means the other ones weren't. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? 
there are not found that re return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. The point is, remember I'm saying, if you realize God's mercy toward you, and you don't think about that so that there's some reasonable service that you would present yourself unto God, that you're nothing but an ungrateful, immature, irresponsible child of God. The response, the only response that, that, that God, Jesus Christ cleanses me, the only response is to her, turn back and just say, thank you, and glorify God. But you know how that ends, and I don't want to confuse you on the gospel, you get saved first. And then after that, you can present yourself, when you understand the mercies of God, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. In Israel's case, Jesus Christ came to them. When it says in verse 19, And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Didn't the other nine, weren't they made whole too? No, they weren't. Their bodies were made whole. They had no more leprosy in the, their body. This man, who understood God's mercy and grace, fell down at the feet of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says, go your way, you're made whole. Can I tell you, until you first trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're not made whole. You can go through some good things in life and experience some nice things and be, get past some sicknesses and disease, but you'll never be whole in life until you first trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And then you will never show gratitude to God and glorify Him until you're willing to present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now it's prayer time, but it's decision time. If you've heard the things being said last week and today and again next week, you understand that I'm pushing you to make some decisions about what you're, you're going to do with the life that God has given you in His Son. And He's waiting for you. He's been waiting for years. You need to do some talking to God. And He didn't ask you to do something. He just asked you that you present yourself. That's what we'll study next week. A living sacrifice. If you're already willing to do it, then why would you wait? And I'm not going to give you the opportunity to have an altar call and show everybody else that you're going to make that decision. But it's time for you to have some serious conversation with the Lord. If you're here and you're lost, you're not whole at all. You need to get saved. You just trust the gospel. Believe on Jesus Christ and you're saved. But those who have been saved for a long time, just living life without a real purpose, then you, there's a decision you need to make in your life, what you're going to do with the life that God has given you in Christ. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you that uh, you love us and you saved us. But Father, we thank you that after you saved us, you didn't leave us in our misery and our and just in our flesh to walk the course of this world. We can escape. We can live life with a purpose, with value, certainly with gratefulness. And, and we can live a life that, that is honoring to you and one that glorifies you. But Father, I pray that none of us would ever live unto ourself and be such a fool to think we can. But Father, I pray that each person here, first that everyone's saved, and that every person who is saved would realize that you've called them for a life of service. And may they just be willing to take their life and offer it to you as a living sacrifice, saying, not my will, but thy will be done. And we pray that you'll receive glory in Christ's name. Amen.